Now, I've been asked to speak about recalibrating our relationship with nature, avoiding future pandemics and zoonotic diseases by behaving decently and respect to other species and to nature and not invading or destroying their habitats. Now, the Native American tribal chief Seattle said, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. End of quote. Despite the fact that everyone would agree, we continue to measure progress in terms of gross domestic product which directly depends on plundering ever more resources from our forests, land and sea. Unless we exchange, no, unless we change, exhausted ecosystems, toxic food and killer diseases will be our karma. In the name of development, indigenous people and farmers continue to be forced off the land into cities to work for distant markets, living as strangers in high rises. We've been trained to spend all hours working and consuming and encouraged to think only about our own well-being as individuals and not about the common good. The writings of controversial philosopher Ayn Rand was promoted to endorse this anthropocentric narrative. In 1961, she said, the first right on earth is the right of the ego. Man's first duty is to himself. Also, she said, every honest man lives for himself. Every man worth calling a man lives for himself. The one who doesn't, doesn't live at all. In the same year, the brilliant Gore Vidal public intellectual and writer commented, Ayn Rand's philosophy is nearly perfect in its immorality, which makes the size of her audience all the more ominous and symptomatic as we enter a curious new phase in our society to justify and extol human greed and egoism is to my mind not only immoral but evil. Blind to the true cost on the broader community, corporate funded land grabs have decimated the number of farms across the world to replace their skills with chemicals and machines. Though hanging on against all odds, according to the UN, 70% of the world is still fed from small scale farmers who retain the knowledge of both growing food and communally building homes with local infrastructure while enhancing nature and, of course, free of debt. How long these farmers will survive is in the balance. A massive development project funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Bank, the UK and US governments has invested into a project called Enabling the Business of Agriculture that promotes large-scale land acquisition and the expansion of agribusinesses in the developing world. Initiated as a pilot in 38 countries in 2017, the land grab is expected to expand to 80 countries in 2019 and 20. To promote this development paradigm across the globe, ministers are holding trade talks in secret. Without democracy, trade deals have become a blank check for global food corporations to slash standards, entrench privatization, and privilege the corporate agenda. However, the present coronavirus pandemic has woken more people in power to the necessity to question the globalization of food and farming. The United Nations Environment Programme report preventing the next pandemic says, the primary risks for future spillover of zoonotic diseases are deforestation of the tropical environment and large scale industrial farming of animals, specifically pigs and chickens at high density. The true cost of this centralized system of animal husbandry is paid for by the broader community in a myriad of ways. Our Farms Not Factories campaign focuses on the pig industry to expose these costs and urge politicians and citizens to end their systematic cruelty, pollution and disease. First, I will describe the decimation of forests through the production of pig feed. Rainforests in Brazil and Cerrado forests in Argentina are still being felled to grow GM soya to feed livestock. The equivalent size of Yorkshire is used to just feed UK livestock. Pigs traditionally eat human food waste, thus performing a useful role in the food cycle. But this was banned in 2001 due to the outbreak of foot and mouth disease, 
which was blamed on farmers giving kitchen waste to their pigs and spread across the world. If contained, the market, the animals get better in a few weeks. However, homogenized pig breeds lack genetic diversity and have compromised immune systems from overcrowding in their intensive barren sheds, so are more susceptible to the spread of disease. So blaming kitchen waste is just convenient for the agri-industry to start to profit from growing and selling livestock feed. Pesticides are used on the soil, forces the pests to go to the nearby small-scale farmers' land, forcing them to also use pesticides, thus decimating the local land and water systems, poisoning local people and biodiversity, and producing toxic food and toxic livestock feed. Now let's look at the true cost of pig production. Both pig production and pork processing are concentrated into the hands of a few vertically integrated systems, meaning that the same company controls the whole process from breeding to retail. The few giant supermarkets buy from the few giant processors, so together they dictate the price. The cheaper the pork, the better for both. So farmers must either get giant, cramming ever more pigs into ever larger sheds, or get out of the industry. To compete, farmers cut costs by externalizing the true cost onto the broader community. Now these costs include the animal cruelty as these intelligent creatures are raised in barren, stinking concrete cages. Their biodegrading feces emits a toxic brew of gases, including hydrogen sulfide and ammonia, that makes pigs sick. They must be given routine doses of antibiotics just to keep them alive. These mutate in the pigs' bodies to produce ag antibiotic resistant strains that then pass from pig to pig and pig to human. The workers are sick, as are the neighbours, and the local ecosystem is dying due to the farmer spreading excessive amounts of pig feces. Michael Greger, author of Bird Flu, a virus of our own hatching and leading nutritionist said, we're changing the way animals live on a global scale. The AIDS virus is blamed on the butchering of primates in the bushmeat trade. The mad cow disease was because we turned cows into carnivores and cannibals. SARS and COVID-19 have been traced back to the exotic wild animal trade. But our last pandemic, swine flu, that arose in 2009, arose not from some backwater market in Asia, but was largely made in the USA in pig industrial operations. Thankfully, swine flu killed only about half a million people. Next time, we might not be so lucky. End quote. The swine flu he mentioned was referred to as N1H1 and first detected in a child near a giant US-owned factory pig farm called Smithfield Foods in Mexico. Today, a closely related virus named H N1H1, G4, has been found in humans and pigs. Neither are ill, and it has not spread human to human yet. So th that is the grisly story behind the consolidated pig production. But livestock processing plants are just as bad. The epicenter of the present COVID-19 pandemic is the vast slaughterhouses combined with packing houses across the US, EU and Brazil. These massive slaughterhouses employ powerless migrant workers so they can pay them low wages and provide poor labour standards. Crammed together at work in a temperature conducive to the COVID virus and with the ventilation system spreading the disease, a great many workers caught the virus. However, due to the absence of decent pay that would have allowed them to recover at home, they stayed at work and spread the disease ever further. Many meat packing, packing plants were closed or slowed down, resulting in a backlog of pigs that had to be cruelly euthanized and taken out of the food chain. The numbers needing to be euthanized in the US are believed to reach 10 million between April and September 2020. 
Lockdown and the search for a vaccine are just treating symptoms and not the root cause of ever more diseases. COVID is just another viral disease. To lessen its impact, we must build our immune systems with healthy food, vitamin C and D and zinc. Instead of mass lockdown, we should have, in my opinion, followed an improved Swedish model by looking after the old and those with underlying illnesses and let it pass through the community. A path that Boris planned to take, pre being guilted by the powerful pharma industry into a national lockdown. This has caused many more deaths than COVID, particularly in countries where there is no furlough, and many small businesses will not survive, not least due to the rent arrears. Pressure to have the vaccine will be endless and suffocating. With such a dirty footprint, it's time to close factory farms. We need to protect our precious network of small scale producers, slaughterhouses, processors, shops and markets. The few that survive in the UK have flourished during lockdown as people realise the value of knowing where their food has come from and how it was made. As a direct consequence, statistically 86% of the UK citizens agree that British farms should grow enough to provide national food security. Long may the awakening last on how important it is to protect our food source for the common good. Instead of being dependent on Wall Street, the Pentagon, global corporations, biotech, high-tech robots, and powerful corporate executive masters, lobbyists, media moguls, and stooge politicians who are all dictating the rules of the game, I hope we will move towards a more local interdependence between people and our bountiful, bountiful but fragile natural worth, world by changing the narrative from exploiting, hoarding, and competing to nurturing, sharing and cooperating as the indigenous nations teach us. But dream on.